All right, hi students, welcome back. And today we are going to get into the progressive era of American history. This corresponds with material from chapter 18 of your text. So we're gonna begin by defining progressivism and then we are going to present examples of different progressive type movements in the United States in the early 20th century. And then we're gonna move on to talk about the first progressive president in US history, Theodore Roosevelt, some of uh, his uh, accomplishments and also some of his um, pursuits, I should, <laughs> it's putting it like politely, um, during uh, his presidency. And, and then we're gonna end um, by talking about Woodrow Wilson. Okay, so we're gonna to begin today by defining progressivism. Progressivism is an era in American history that is uh, basically the era between 1900 and 1916. Um, it kind of drops off of the radar once we get into um, World War I. Um, but we do sort of see some progressive stuff like the populist movement happening as far back as the 1890s. So you can really sort of define this movement as being really probably about a three, if we were to put a large parameter on it, it would be from about 1890 to 1920. And this is a political movement. Um, this is a movement of different groups that are wanting to see reform in government. And specifically, they wanted to see government respond to social inequities, to labor problems, to poverty, to the power of big business. Um, they really wanted to see some of these issues in society be controlled and regulated by government. And so they are, um, all the progressives have in common this belief that ideas of freedom must be infused with new meaning to adapt to a changing world. Um, so this means that they understand, the progressives understand that the world is changing um, and that the demographics of the United States is changing, the population of the United States is growing, uh, the environment that people are living in is changing from rural to urban. And so because of these changes, there needs to be a government that responds to these changes. Um, and so what is what are the progressives responding to? Well, they're responding to widespread political corruption, um, economic inequality, women's rights, uh, many of them were suffragettes, the power of big business. Um, remember we talked about how big business is basically huge and powerful and completely unregulated in the United States. Uh, they're interested in workers' rights and giving power to labor unions, uh, civil rights to a certain extent, um, and then poverty and vice and um, the vice part of this is mostly uh, addressing issues such as alcoholism and widespread prostitution. So these are the issues that progressives are interesting, interested in remedying. And there are several different ways and different types of groups that are going to go about this, these solutions in different ways. And those are who we're gonna talk about next. So one of the groups fighting for change in the turn of the century is the Socialist Party. And this is a time in American history when political plural, pluralism is um, not that unusual. You have these various different uh, political groups that are rising up and vying for power in the United States. And the Socialist Party was one of them. Now the Socialist Party um, believed that government ownership of corporations could benefit the masses, that if the government owned um, certain types of essential services, that this would be beneficial to the population at large. So we're talking about services such as education and healthcare. Um, 
public ownership of essential services such as um, electricity and water, any type of utility, right? Um, obviously police and fire and those types of things. Um, the Socialist Party was also a big supporter of the labor unions and they believed that workers should have the right to a minimum wage and an eight hour work day and fair working conditions. And um, they wanted to see labor unions have more power and influence and the ability to collective bargain. So socialism was a movement that fell within the parameters of the Progressive Party because it was looking for change. Um, and it was coming up with ideas of ways that the government could address some of these social and economic issues that it was facing at the turn of the century. Socialism became quite popular in the United States, that might surprise you. Um, there were 340 municipalities that elected Socialist Party candidates. Um, there were 79 mayors of cities who uh, proclaimed to be socialists, including the mayor of Butte, Montana, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Berkeley, California. They had their own newsletter. Um, one of the most famous of these was the newsletter Appeal to Reason um, that would get sent out to people and they would read a monthly newsletter. It had at one point 750,000 subscribers. So the idea is that um, the United States had the ability to become uh, more utopian, um, more in, uh, along the lines of taking care of one another. So let's look at a map that shows where the concentration of socialist political action was taking place at the turn of the century. So you can see here socialist towns and cities from 1900 to 1920. And you'll notice um, there's a huge concentration actually up here in the Great Lakes region um, in the Midwest. Um, this was in, uh, in large part in response to the labor movements in these regions. Um, but you'll also see that there are um, some areas out here in the West, including um, Berkeley, as I've already mentioned, Daly City and Watts in Los Angeles. So if you click on this link, it will talk a little bit more about socialism and talk about socialism and the history of socialism in the United States. One of the major socialist leaders at the time was a man by the name of Eugene Debs. Um, he becomes a major labor organizer and also a socialist party candidate for president five times. Um, throughout the course of his life. He has an interesting life. He left home at the age of 14, where he went to go work on a railroad as a fireman. Um, next, he moved to uh, Indiana, where he worked at as a city clerk. Um, and then later on, he serves as the Indi in the Indiana State Legislature. He believed that labor should be organized by industry, not by craft. Um, so he would have been much more in line with the Knights of Labor. Um, he becomes the president of the American Railway Union in 1893. And in 1894, he leads a strike against the Great Northern Railway and also the Pullman Company. Um, he will actually be jailed for six months for leading the Pullman strike. And while he's in jail, during the as a result of the Pullman strike in 1894 is when he becomes a socialist. Um, he after he leaves uh, jail, um, he will go on to um, co-found the IWW, which we will talk about in a minute. Um, and then in 1917, Eugene Debs is charged with espionage after he had He's, well, he's charged with sedition under the Espionage Act um, and will spend four years in prison after he gives an anti-war speech. So he gives this anti-World War I speech and ends up getting in prison. 
His sentence was actually 10 years, but it was commuted after four years. He loses his U.S. citizenship for the remainder of his life, and he also loses his right to vote. So he is a very powerful figure in American history, but as we get to um, the latter part of his career um, in the 19 teens, he is essentially silenced. Um, and he's done it, the way that that happens is through these espionage and sedition acts, which are passed during World War I, which we will talk about when we talk about World War I. Um, one of the, mo the highlights, really, I think, of his career was in 1912 when he ran for president um, as the Socialist Party candidate, and he actually won 6% of the popular vote in the 1912 election. So it goes to show how um, powerful the message of the socialists were and how um, influential they were overall at the turn of the 20th century. Okay, so as I mentioned, Eugene Debs was a co-founder of the IWW, which stands for the Industrial Workers of the World. This is an organization, labor organization, that was created in order to kind of unite workers worldwide. Um, and the idea was that you would organize workers by industry instead of skill or trade to make the uh, union more powerful. So in other words, if you worked in the car manufacturing industry, then you would have one big giant union for car manufacturing. Um, if you worked in the, you know, uh, appliance making industries, you would have one giant union for appliance makers. And the idea is that you're stronger and more powerful in numbers. Now, part of the IWW's message was also had a Marxist twist to it and that they advocated for this idea of a workers' revolution. Um, the idea that at a certain point in history that the workers would rise up against uh, their employers and demand to have a certain amount of capital, um, demand to be able to have a certain amount of the profits um, that were being reaped from their labor. And the biggest um, leader of this movement in the turn of the century was William Big Bill Hayward. Um, and he will become, in the United States, uh, the, war, uh, the uh, movement's most prominent leader. Um, so if you look at their, their um, seal here, you will see that it says around the edge, when someone tells you they got rich through hard work, ask them, whose, in other words, whose hard work did you get rich from? Um, was it your own hard work or was it that of your workers? So the IWW is really recognizing the value that workers bring and the fact that workers equal capital to the big businessmen, to the industrials, to the bankers, to the investors. Okay, so now we're going to turn our attention to talking about a woman by the name of Emma Goldman. And I should say she is a very sort of notorious figure in U.S. history. She um, is uh, responsible for kind of really being the figurehead of uh, the anarchist movement in the United States at the turn of the century. She considered herself a political radical and a feminist. She immigrated to uh, the United States in 1885, and she was um, born in what is now modern day Lithuania, but at that time was part of the Russian Empire. She advocated throughout her life, um, very sort of it for her time, and especially for a woman, radical ideas. Um, she gave speeches on uh, free speech. 
She gave speeches on birth control and the importance of birth control for women's uh, rights. Um, she gave speeches on women's equality and independence. She advocated for union organization. And during uh, World War I, she publicly criticized mandatory conscription laws, basically the draft. And as a result of that, she will spend two years in prison beginning in 1917. And then, <coughs> excuse me, in 1919, she will be deported. She becomes an anarchist um, after the Haymarket Affair. We talked about the Haymarket Affair when we talked about labor. And um, she ends up founding this anarchist journal titled Mother Earth. And um, she is, uh, uh, she decides that she's going to embrace this philosophy of anarchy because um, anarchy doesn't necessarily belie um, believe in no government. That's often a misunderstanding about anarchism. Anarchism simply believes that, that people should govern themselves and that um, there should be smaller organizations of governing bodies. Um, and that government in and of itself um, as a large institution tends to be violent um, and restricting liberty. And, um, and so that was sort of her underlying ideas. Um, she was considered a very dangerous woman for her time and it is no um, surprise that she eventually does get deported in 1919. Uh, she never returns uh, to the United States, um, but later on she uh, does, uh, she had gotten deported back to Russia, but later, later in her life she actually leaves Russia and moves to Canada. Um, and she actually writes a book in 1923 called My Disillusionment, Disillusionment with Russia. Um, and she was responding to um, the violence that erupted in Russia in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. So another major thing that's happening at this time is this um, opening up of women in terms of the feminist movement. And this is, this is really sort of uh, women embracing their um, sexual identities um, and their artistic identities. And this is not, this is a, really a step away from, it, it, it's a much more radical movement than like the suffragettes who were fighting specifically for the right of women to vote. Um, the new feminism is really about women um, embracing their femininity, embracing um, their sexuality. And here you see a picture of Isidore Duncan. Um, she is sort of, uh, in many ways, the symbol of this new feminism. It, the, in the early 20th century, she was a dancer and, in, and she's kind of responsible. She's, she's considered the mother of modern dance, of sort of free form dance. Um, and this idea of a radical bohemia, um, you know, uh, that women could be intellectual, that women could be creative, um, that women could embrace their sexuality. So there were various groups that were emerging during this time, mostly in California and New York, um, groups like Feminist Alliance and Heterodoxy. Um, and these were all groups that would get together and talk about what does it mean um, to be a woman, how can we redefine ourselves, and how can we redefine our intimate relationships, right? Like our relationships with men, um, our relationships to motherhood, um, all of those types of questions. So those were the types of things that these women were exploring. Now these women were definitely in the minority at this time, but it's important to acknowledge that these um, types of ideas um, were out there and were being explored. Okay, um, another element to this is the birth control movement. And the face of the birth control movement in the early 20th century is a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. Now, Margaret Sanger, since um, her 
um, time as an activist has since become kind of a controversial figure um, because she did advocate for um, birth control. Um, but when reevaluating sort of her role um, in history, it um, it's questionable as to what her motivations were for implementing birth control. So she has since been criticized for opening up birth control clinics in lower income neighborhoods and immigrant neighborhoods and places like Brooklyn. However, it should be acknowledged that despite the controversy around Margaret Sanger's legacy, that um, she does bring up this argument um, for birth control and the fact that women should have the ability to control their reproductive rights um, and that in giving women the ability to control their reproduction, you are also giving them the ability to control their fate, their destiny, um, um, the, their future, right? So it is, it's an important a contribution to um, the history of feminism. But again, it, I do want to acknowledge the fact that she is considered a controversial figure today. Um, she writes a book, um, or she writes, actually, it's an article um, in The Call magazine um, called What Every Girl uh, Should Know. And this is, again, trying to appeal to women to understand their bodies, understand how their bodies work, understand the physiology, so that you could have an element of power and control over your future. Okay, probably one of the most um, popular um, progressive movements in the early 20th century is the women's suffrage movement. And this is the fight for women to have the right to vote in the United States. As you can see by 1917, the women's National Women's Suffrage Association's numbers will grow significantly to two million strong. Wyoming is going to be the first state in the nation to grant women the right to vote, and this will be in 1890. They will soon be followed by other states like Colorado, Idaho, and Utah. California gave women the right to vote in 1912. So this was a long-standing fight for women. Um, going back to the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, where the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments for Women was crafted. Um, and this idea that women should be able to have a political voice um, had, been, uh, had been talked about for half, half a century up until this point. And, but it starts to gain momentum as the movement grows and also as men begin to join the movement. Um, you also see the first female congresswoman um, getting voted into office in 1916. Her name was Jeanette Rankin, um, and she, she was a Republican from Montana. And um, this is all during a time period. So 1916, World War I has already broken out. World War I starts in 1914. And women throughout um, the country are rising up and protesting for a right to vote. They see this as an opportune time, primarily because the country is rallying around this idea of democracy and fighting for freedoms, particularly after the U.S. gets involved in the conflict in 1917. Women really start to ramp up their efforts to push the government to recognize um, women's political rights. And you start to see women um, protesting in front of the White House. And again, this was very controversial because we're in the middle of a world war, but women saw this as a good opportunity to get their voices heard, particularly because there was a lot of women contributing to the war effort at the time. Ultimately, Woodrow Wilson, who is the president at the time that these women suffragettes are staging these massive protests, um, that he will eventually give in and support the idea of women's suffrage and the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, 
which will go into effect in 1920. So if you click on this link below, um, you will be able to uh, get a bio, bio sketch of Jeanette Rankin and her life and her contribution to American politics. And there's Jeanette Rankin. Okay, another uh, big progressive movement that's taking place at this time are the settlement houses. And settlement houses are popping up all over the United States, um, particularly in urban areas, in order to help the poor, mostly immigrant populations of the major cities. The first to open up um, will be in New York City in 1886, um, a woman by the name of Lillian Wald, who had traveled to England um, and where settlement houses already existed, will bring them over here to America. And then probably the most famous uh, woman associated with settlement houses are, is Jane Addams, who will open the whole house in Chicago. Now, what, what are settlement houses? Um, they're basically like community centers. Um, some of them served as boarding houses, but they also served as just community centers where you could go, you could get a hot meal, you could maybe get child care if you needed to go to work and you didn't have any other place to bring your child. You might go to a settlement house to get um, English lessons. You might go there to for help in filling out your naturalization paperwork if you're an immigrant. Um, so there were a lot of different services that settlement houses provided they were immensely popular. As you can see from the slide, their numbers grew from six, just six in 1891, to over 400 in 1911. So in a very short period of time, these settlement houses grow in number simply based on the need. So what you're seeing here are photographs of different settlement houses. You can see here a dining hall, food is being provided, and here you have a nursery, which looks very dangerous to me. Every time I see this photograph, I go, oh no, those babies are going to fall off of that table, <laughs> and the lady's smoking a cigarette, but, you know, it's better than, I guess, nothing and not being able to have any place to bring your child if you have to go to work, so, um, there it is, uh, settlement houses, and, and, and providing a very important service. And again, these are these are times where there is no kind of government support for any of these kinds of services. Okay, the final uh, progressive movement that we are going to talk about today is the temperance movement. Um, now, the temperance movement was a movement in the United States to ban the sale and manufacture of alcohol. The temperance movement itself actually goes all the way back to the early 1800s, where it was primarily a religious movement where people would take individual temperance pledges, where they would say, I am going to abstain from alcohol. And this was something that they did publicly, maybe at their church on Sunday. Um, and then, you know, they would remain sober. And this was done because alcoholism was a real problem. But as we get into the 20th century, there's more and more an outcry for the government to respond to the problems of alcoholism and the problems that alcoholism brings. Um, and so in the 1880s, you start to see this movement gain momentum. Um, and then finally, it will really gain momentum, similar to the suffrage movement in the war years um, between 1814 and eight, 19, excuse me, 1914 and 1918. Um, some of what the temperance movement was doing during World War I was talking about how um, the grains that were being used to um, create a beer, and create hard alcohol could be better served, you know, feeding people during World War I. So that was one of their sort of wartime arguments that they used. Um, they also had this sort of really anti-beer um, 
movement because beer was associated with Germans, you know, and we we're fighting the Germans in World War One. So, but um, the temperance movement will really take off with an organization called the Anti Saloon League. Um, this Anti Saloon League made the temperance movement basically a wedge issue, meaning that they forced politicians to either side with them or side against them so that they made it so there were two types of voters, the voters that were in favor of temperance and the vote voters that were not in favor of temperance. And that part of the Anti-Saloons League message goes hand in hand with that anti-immigrant nativist message that was happening also in the early 20th century. Um, associating immigrant and foreign influences with the consumption of alcohol. Um, so the temperance movement gains momentum and it will eventually be successful in passing the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, um, thereby instituting prohibition for 13 years from 1920 to 1933. Okay, so if you click on this link right here, um, it will take you to a video talking about the history of alcohol consumption in the United States and the real uh, perceived need for um, the temperance solution in the early 20th century. Because I think um, for many of us, it's kind of hard to understand why did they want to um, ban the sale and manufacture of alcohol so bad. Well, this video will help clarify some of those questions. Now, we will be talking more about prohibition when we get into the 1920s. Um, but for now, um, just know that the temperance movement was successful and they were able to get the 18th Amendment to the United States passed. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about America's first progressive president. President Theodore Roosevelt, who will be in office from 1901 to 1909. So let me give you a quick bio sketch of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he comes from the Roosevelt clan of New York, a very old um, New York family going all the way back to the Dutch settlement of the um, colony of New Amsterdam. And um, he, uh, you know, was raised a very, a very wealthy family with uh, lots of siblings. Um, he was very much encouraged and influenced by his father, um, who really pushed him to um, look at the world around him and judge it um, based on, uh, based on truth. And um, so when he becomes a member of the New York Assembly after graduating from Harvard with honors, um, he uh, really gets to work at trying to eliminate corruption from politics. Now, this was very controversial in New York. New York was notorious for having corrupted state politics, lots of insider information, lots of backroom deals, lots of kickbacks, lots of different um, corruptive things in New York state politics. And so um, he made a lot of friends, but he also made a lot of enemies at the New York State Assembly. And, um, and then a very tragic thing happens um, to Theodore Roosevelt. Um, on the same night, um, both his mother and his wife die. And his wife has just given birth to a daughter and she died from complications of uh, childbirth and then his mom died of typhoid fever. And again, they both die and it's February 14th, um, Valentine's Day that this happens on. And he's just completely devastated. He has this newborn infant daughter, her name's Alice, named after her mother and he doesn't know what to do. So he hands his little newborn daughter over to his sister, Bammy, 
um, and says, you know, please take care of her. I can't handle this. I have to go clear my head. Um, and he leaves New York and he goes out to the Dakota Territory to ranch. Um, and he had been um, dabbling with ranching in the Dakota Territory for a while. But this time he was really going out there to experience the life as a cowboy. And when he gets out there, you know, the, the cowboys out there kind of look at him and laugh at him. He's got all the fanciest, you know, um, you know, chaps and the gun and the everything, you know, here's this rich boy, city slicker, you know, but he ends up actually really proving himself out there in the, in the Dakota Territory and wins the respect of a lot of people. Um, would often go out on long cattle runs, camping under the stars. Um, he really knew how to rough it. And he might have stayed out there for longer had it not been for a woman who started to correspond with him, an old high school sweetheart by the name of Edith. And she begins to write him letters which kind of lure him back to New York. And he ends up moving back to New York and marrying Edith and they will remain married for the rest of his life and they will have five children together. Um, and Alice will come back to their household and be raised um, in their household. So um, once he returns to New York, he becomes the New York City uh, Police Commissioner um, and then he gets sent to Washington to be Secretary of the Navy, and this is under the McKinley administration, and this is um, uh, during the, um, he was Secretary of the Navy during the Spanish-American War, where he decided to send the fleet out to the Philippines ahead of time. He made that quick decision, and then he resigns as Secretary of the Navy and joins the war effort as part of the Rough Riders. Um, and that's where he really sort of gains his notoriety. And um, he writes a book about it when he returns from the Spanish-American War. And um, he eventually will get elected as governor of New York. Now, as governor of New York, he was causing all kinds of headaches for corrupt politicians throughout the state. And they wanted nothing more than to just get rid of him. So they cook up a plan to send him to Washington as the vice presidential candidate in the 1900 election. So he becomes the vice presidential candidate for William McKinley. And then just several months into McKinley's second term, McKinley is shot and killed, um, assassinated at the Buffalo World's Fair. And um, here is Teddy Roosevelt, the uh, youngest uh, vice president, he's 42 years old, he will become the youngest president to ever serve in the United States. Um, JFK is a close second at 43, but um, Theodore Roosevelt is the youngest president to ever serve. And so here's this troublemaking um, politician who they wanted to get rid of by sending him to the vice presidency, but here he comes, now he is going to be the president of the United States. So you can click on this link right here and it will bring you to a uh, video about um, Theodore Roosevelt's presidency. It has some cool moving images so you really get a sense of his, um, the, his presence, his physical presence, which was a big part of his personality. He was incredibly energetic. He was always moving around. He was always talking. Um, he, he ends up being an extremely popular president. Now, although he was very popular with the people, um, he certainly was not very popular when it came to um, other countries. And that's because Theodore Roosevelt was indeed an unabashed imperialist. Um, he had no qualms about making it very clear um, to everybody that he felt that the United States was the best country in the world. And he felt like the United States should have the right to have supremacy in the Western Hemisphere. And an example of how he felt about this can be seen with how he created the country of Panama. So the French had been working on building a Panama Canal since the 1880s. 
they, uh, the French had actually completed the Suez Canal um, over the, um, uh, in um, the east that connects the Red Sea with the Mediterranean Sea. They had completed that in 1870. And they moved on to try to attempt to build a canal across the Panamanian Isthmus. The problem was that it was a much more difficult job. Um, not only are you working in a hot tropical climate, but you also have the element of disease through malaria, especially through mosquitoes. You have geographic obstacles, these big rocky mountains that you have to blast through. And there was also problems with financing. So um, they, the French actually come to the United States and they asked them to help them um, finance and maybe even take over the building of the Panama Canal. And when this happens, Roosevelt decides that he will reach out to the Colombian government to try to work out a deal so that they could have a right of way basically to build this canal across the Panamanian Isthmus. Now you might want to say, hmm, why Colombia? Well, the answer to that is because Panama was not a country at that time. Panama was simply a province within the larger country of Colombia. So technically, the Panamanian Isthmus fell within the boundaries of the country of Colombia. And Colombia drove a hard bargain and did not want to negotiate on the terms that Roosevelt wanted to negotiate. So basically what happens is Roosevelt decides that he is going to encourage the Panamanians to revolt against the Colombian government. And when they did, um, immediately the United States uh, recognizes the independent country of Panama and then begins to negotiate a treaty with them. So if you want to see more information about this, you can click on this YouTube link and it will bring you to a, um, a more of a, an in-depth story on how this went, came about. So what will come out of this um, trickery um, that the Roosevelt administration pulled on the Colombian government is something called the Hay banu Varilla Treaty. Um, and this is a treaty in 1903 that is um, signed uh, between the United States and Panama. Now, the interesting thing about this treaty is that no Panamanian ever signs this treaty. Uh, Banu Varilla, who you see pictured here in this photograph, is the French representative that will sign this treaty for the Panamanians on behalf of the Panamanians. However, the Panamanians never really gave him the authorization to do that. So the U.S., um, uh, through in this treaty, what it says is that the U.S. will have a 10-mile wide strip known as the Canal Zone um, all the way across the Isthmus. Um, they will pay $10 million and then a $250,000 annual annuity to start um, nine years later um, to Panama. So it, you'll, they'll be paying the country of Panama in nine years time to as a, an annuity payment to um, allow for the United States to continue to have access and rights and control over the Panama Canal. So the this story, the story of the acquisition in the, of the Panama Canal is a story that really represents how Roosevelt really thought in his imperialistic mindset. He really felt that the United States was superior. He felt like the United States had a right um, to have control over affairs in the Western Hemisphere. So here we see a map that um, shows the Isthmus. This is the Panamanian Isthmus. Um, you can see the canal is built right here. This is the railroad. The railroad also runs along the Isthmus. This is the old railroad. This was the old way to get across the Isthmus. But if you wanted to get across it in its new sort of modern form, you would take the canal. And you can see here along the canal, there are these various locks. And these locks are meant to 
um, change the depth of the water because the Pacific Ocean and the Carib uh, over here and the Caribbean Sea over here are two different depths. So they needed to adjust the depths as you went across the canal. So if you were coming from the east and wanting to get over to the Pacific Ocean, you could come do the canal that way. If you were coming from the Pacific and wanted to get over to the east, you would take the canal that way. Um, and you'll notice here there's this big lake, Gatam Lake, um, that is in the middle of the canal zone. So they utilize the fact that there's already this lake here so that they didn't have to blast too much, but they did have to blast a significant portion here on the Pacific side and then also a little bit over here um, on the Caribbean side. Again, clicking on this link will give you some more information about the building of the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal was built primarily by Caribbean labor force. Um, this is a um, boat filled with Barbadian um, laborers from Barbados. Um, and so this these uh, men uh, really sacrificed a, a huge, um, you know, it really sacrificed um, to build this canal. Many, many died. Um, the working conditions were not good. There were long hours. And again, there was lots of exposure to diseases and dangerous working conditions. So on August 15th, 1914, um, the Panama Canal will open, um, connecting the world's two largest oceans and sing signaling America's emergence as a global superpower. Um, this also has another effect in that it really links um, the two sides, the two coasts of the United States in a much more efficient way. So the West Coast is now going to link uh, much better with the East Coast. Um, eventually, the United States is going to be forced to compensate Colombia for its loss of Panama. And this happens in 1921 um, because it was recognized even at that time that this was an, uh, an injustice that the United States had carried out against Colombia. Um, the other thing is the, the Panamanians. Um, what about them? And was there an injustice committed against them? Well, uh, modern politicians thought so. And during the Carter, Carter, Jimmy Carter administration in the 1970s, it was decided that the Panama Canal and the Canal Zone would be given to the Panamanian people um, for control, you know, so that the Panamanian people could have control over the Canal Zone, could generate revenue from the Canal Zone, etc. And so that date was set for the year 2000. Um, and it happened, um, and in the year 2000, the Panamanian Canal was finally put into the hands of the Panamanian people. Okay, so that's an example of Roosevelt's imperialism. Now let's return domestically to what he is doing on the home front. And one of the good ways to remember what Roosevelt's achievements were are the three C's, conservation, control of corporations, and consumer protection. We will begin with control of corporations because this is actually one of the first things that he does as president is he enacts the Sherman Antitrust Act. This was a trust act, um, an act of Congress that was actually passed in 1890, but nobody ever used it. The Attorney General of the United States never enforced it. And it wasn't until 1901 that the Roosevelt uh, administration basically ordered his Attorney General to take the Sherman Antitrust Act and interpret it in a way that it will curb the power of monopolies in the United States. And so, um, the first monopoly to be targeted uh, by um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his trust busting efforts is the Northern Securities Company. This is a massive railroad company owned by JP Morgan and it will be broken up under the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1901. Throughout um, the Roosevelt administration, there will be 43 trusts that will eventually be broken up. They will include Northern Securities, 
um, big tobacco companies, uh, DuPont, um, and Standard Oil, amongst others. So um, he becomes known as the trust buster, the guy that's going to break up these various uh, monopolies. He also does something that no other president has done, and that is support striking workers. And he does this in 1902. There's this massive coal strike that takes place, and the workers are wanting better work conditions, better pay, um, and Roosevelt intervenes in this strike. And he does this because coal is an essential ingredient. It, it, requi it requires coal to run the the uh, railroads, it requires coal to heat homes and run stoves, and it is really sort of this essential item. And with the coal workers going on strike, it is making that item hard to increasing the cost of that item, etc. So he intervenes. But be unlike before him, presidents before him had intervened on behalf of the big business. In this instance, he is intervening on behalf of the workers and he requires the coal companies to sit down and negotiate with their workers. It's a very powerful gesture that an American president would side with the workers and not big business like they had been doing for a, a century before. Then you also have the Hepburn Act of 1906. This will uh, regulate freight rates um, so that railroad companies can no longer price gouge consumers and businesses. Uh, the Antiquities Act was also passed in 1906. This was an act of Congress that allows for the president to set aside lands for protection. Originally it was uh, meant to protect um, national treasures, antiquities, um, archaeological sites, those types of things, but it has been expanded to just uh, protecting certain types of lands with precious resources, um, and also delicate environments. Um, the Antiquities Act is still alive and well today. Presidents can still use the Antiquities Act to set aside land, and in fact, President Obama set aside um, hundreds of thousands of acres under the Antiquities Act. Also in 1906, we have the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act, and this again is, goes, falls under the consumer protection part of the three C's. And here we're talking about uh, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, being created to oversee um, and protect the public from uh, food and drugs that could harm them, um, making sure that food is being processed in plants that are clean to prevent diseases, those types of things. So there was a big uproar um, during this time period. A novel came out um, by Upton Sinclair called The Jungle that was basically exposing the way that meat packing plants um, were processing meat um, back in the early 20th century. And it would, you would often get sick, you know, eating um, food that you would buy at the store because of the way that it was processed in the plant. So this was in response to that. It was also in response to the fact that drugs were easily accessible. We were talking you could go to the drugstore and get, you know, cocaine or morphine or, you know, whatever, and, and that caused a lot of problems with addiction as well. So um, the other um, sort of achievement, big achievement of Roosevelt is he becomes the first U.S. president to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and he wins that in 1906 um, after negotiating a settlement between Russia and Japan at the end of the Russo-Japanese War. And then finally, um, you may have heard of Theodore Roosevelt being referred to as Teddy. Um, and that actually goes back to a, a, an event that happens during his presidency. Um, in 1903, he was on a hunting, a bear hunting trip in Mississippi. And all of the people in his entourage had actually, you know, successfully killed a bear except for the president. And so one of the people in, in his entourage decided to grab a bear and tie up the bear and, and hold it for him and say, here, Mr. President, you know, here's your, your bear, here's your prize. And he refuse, refuses to shoot it. Well, there just happened to be a reporter present um, from uh, the Washington Post, and he writes a story about this and draws this little cartoon, and so he 
as, as a result of this story, gets the nickname Teddy. And then teddy bears become a popular um, children's uh, stuffed animal here in the United States. They were already popular in Germany, but they get imported over to the United States after this story breaks out. Okay, and then probably one of the biggest and most lasting legacies of the uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, presidency is the establishment of the national parks and the conservation movement. Um, so Theodore Roosevelt loved the outdoors um, and he also loved to hunt and um, but he he really did have an appreciation for the outdoors and he understood that the United States had all of these lands that were diverse, um, all of these lands that were very pristine um, and he understood and appreciated that they should be preserved for generations to come. And so in his presidency, he sets aside six national parks, 18 national monuments, 150 national forests, 51 bird sanctuaries, 53 wildlife preserves. Later on, after his administration is over, the National Park Service will be created in 1916 to oversee the running of these parks. And the picture that you see right there is Yosemite Valley here in California, which is one of the national parks that was created under the Roosevelt administration. So we see these places of beauty that have been preserved um, and and it really is a legacy of the Theodore Roosevelt presidency. Um, he is not the only one that was talking about preserving natural lands at this time. You have, of course, the famous conservationist John Muir, who was also advocating for this. But Theodore Roosevelt, because of his power as the president of the United States, was really able to make this an issue. A, a political issue during his presidency and one that will continue to be passed on even to modern times where we continue to hopefully protect our wildlands um, throughout the country. So you can click on this link and you will um, get a video talking about Roosevelt's visit to the Grand Canyon, the first time that he saw the Grand Canyon and some of the things that he had to say. Okay, so after Roosevelt leaves um, the presidency, his successor will be William Howard Taft. And um, Taft will um, serve four years as president, and then he will lose the 1912 presidential election to Woodrow Wilson. Now, all three of these presidents are considered progressive presidents. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson, all considered progressive presidents, all basically um, supported progressive legislation. So I'm going to focus on Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson is going to be the president that's going to see us through World War I. So we're going to be talking a lot about him when we talk about World War I. Um, so let's, let's see who he is. So Woodrow Wilson is um, the only president to ever serve in office with a PhD, and he had a PhD in political science. Um, so he was very much an academic when it came to the subject of politics. He wanted to see politics as um, problems that could potentially be solved and be solved sort of scientifically, critically, um, methodically, logically, right? And that's the way that he really went about his presidency. Um, he created some presidential precedents um, while he was in office. He was the first president to hold regu regular press conferences. And he was also the first president to make an in-person, regular in-person addresses to the US Congress. He was extremely idealistic and um, he didn't have a whole lot of experience in politics prior to coming to the presidency. He had been the president of Princeton University and he had been the governor of New Jersey. And that was the extent of his um, leadership experience prior to becoming president. 
So in many ways, he was unprepared for the um, crisis that he is going to face with World War I. But on the other hand, he also um, has sort of a lot of the sort of idealism and um, hope and um, thoughtfulness that you would want um, from a leader during a time of crisis. Okay, so um, I'm, there's a lot on this slide and, and basically I'm just gonna focus on the two um, key terms for, you, for the class. Um, but you, you know, you should know that there are, there's a lot of legislation being passed during this time all with a progressive bend to them, right? So um, the 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution allows for a graduated income tax, graduated federal income tax, I should say, passed in 1913. Um, uh, the 17th Amendment um, allows for the direct election of senators, also 1913. So this is when um, the, pop, uh, uh, the population is going to be allowed to, the voting population is going to be allowed to vote for who their senators will be. Um, prior to 1913, the state legislatures chose who the senators would be. Um, the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution outlaws 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution outlaws the sale and manufacture of alcohol. Um, again, this goes into effect in 1920, and this is the result of the temperance movement. We are going to talk in much greater detail about prohibition when we get into the 1920s. The 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution gives women the right to vote, also going into effect in 1920, but had been in effect in certain states prior to that. So this just makes it a blanket. All women in the United States now have the right to vote after 1920, but in certain states, women had the right to vote prior to 1920. Other types of progressive legislation, the Clayton Act, with which has strengthened the power of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So this is the act that's being used to curb the power of the monopolistic corporations in the United States. Um, the Adamson Act, which is an eight hour, um, implements an eight hour workday for railway workers. Um, that's in 1916. And again, these are things that people had been fighting for for a long time, right? The Federal Trade Commission, um, outlaws trade that harms consumers. Um, that's implemented in 1914. So you see steps um, by the federal government um, during the progressive era to try to correct some of these problems um, that had been going on for quite some time throughout the 19th century. Okay, so I will, this is the um, summary slide. I will leave this to you to read. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. You can always um, zoom into office hours or you can send me an email. Um, ho I'm hoping to have a review session next week before the midterm exam. So I will be sending out an email about that. For now, have a great day and I'll see you later.